An overhead power line operates as a channel to transfer electromagnetic waves of varying voltage levels across a variety of distances, environments, and landscapes to supply electrical power where it is needed. Power line cables are structurally supported by utility poles or steel towers, which are designed to keep the line suspended at a safe height. This ensures that there is a sufficient amount of ground clearance minimizing the risk of the live lines being disturbed or damaged. Overhead power lines come in different types and lengths to accommodate varying voltage loads. This enables them to serve the entire spectrum of industrial and residential electrical supply purposes. As a rule, overhead lines are composed of steel lattice towers built on top of a foundation, one or more earth wires as well as the live conductors, which are attached to the tower cross arms transfer skirters via insulators. The overhead lines of high voltage grid are usually constructed with two electrical circuits. In order to bundle electricity lines, overhead lines with four or six systems are also sometimes constructed. The electrical circuits can therefore have different voltage levels and frequencies. Transmission Line Structures The primary functions of transmission line structures are to provide mechanical support to conductors. This is achieved by maintaining mechanical integrity without permanent structural deformation under ultimate load conditions whilst preserving structure geometry to retain operational electrical clearances under prescribed serviceability and ultimate load conditions. Secondary functions of transmission line structures are to ensure safety of people and the environment, Maintain structure geometry to preserve maintenance safe approach distances for serviceability and ultimate load conditions, provide an electrical path to earth for fault currents. Structure types include freestanding and guide, lattice towers, steel tubular poles, stoby poles, concrete poles. The conductors. They are the most important component of a power line, as they transport the energy. The material used depends on the electrical properties e.g. the electrical conductivity and mechanical properties e.g. strength. When electricity was first transmitted in the 19th century, copper was the main conductive material used. However, it was later replaced by aluminum and steel reinforced aluminum conductors, considering that aluminum weighs less and is cheaper. As a result of the contact between aluminum and the oxygen in the air, it also creates a tight oxide layer that protects the metal against further corrosion, even in rough weather conditions. The primary function of transmission line conductor systems is to transfer electrical power between designated locations, within prescribed performance, operating and environmental con conditions. Secondary functions of transmission line conductors are to maintain electrical safety and minimize adverse effects on the environment, and provide a whole-of-life cost-effective service. The earth wires earth wires are earthed in conductive wires that are used on overhead lines with a voltage of 50 kilovolts and more. They are fitted to the tower tops. Their main purpose is to protect the conductors against direct lightning strikes, grid optimization and grid reinforcement. The need for transmission in the grid is increasing, among other things due to the integration of renewable energy. The focus lies on operating facilities that would in theory be chronically overloaded in case of a failure, the so-called congested lines or structural bottlenecks. Transmission Line Earthing The primary functional requirement of a transmission line earthing system is to provide an electrical path for lightning and fault currents to earth, to ensure safety of people, assets, and the environment, ensure that faults are cleared within the NER time limits. Provide an earth zero potential reference to ground. Secondary functional requirements of a transmission earthing system for its design life are to maintain electrical safety and minimize adverse effects on the environment, provide an effective technical solution. Transmission line earthing relates to aerial earthing. This subsystem includes shield wire in OPGW and its various supporting hardware and fittings, strain assembly, suspension assembly, spark gap insulators, vibration dampers, joints, and marker balls. Ground-level earthing this subsystem includes buried earth stakes, earth bounds PVC, PVC cable, copper strap, cable lugs, fasteners and clamps. Communication hardware this subsystem includes the interface fiber hardware for OPGW assets. This includes fiber splice boxes, fiber termination boxes, etc. Transmission line insulators. Transmission line insulation has two primary functions to insulate energized components from earthed structures at rated operating voltages and specified switching and lightning impulses, and to support the conductor system up to ultimate mechanical load limits and transfer the mechanical loads to structure. 
Transmission line hardware has four primary functions, to support the insulator system up to electrical load limits, to support the insulator system up to ultimate mechanical load limits, to provide effective attachment interface between conductor and insulators to securely transfer loads to the structure, and life cost effective services. Why does the conductor heat up? When electricity flows through a conductor, this creates heat. The smaller the conductor cross-section, the more often the individual electrons collide with each other. This friction produces the so-called resistance heating effect also known as joule heat. How hot the conductor becomes also depends on other factors, such as the outdoor temperature, the wind, and the solar irradiation. For the long-term reinforcement of the grids, existing lines are more and more often refitted with innovative high-temperature conductors HT or HTLS, whereas traditional aluminum steel conductors cannot exceed a maximum operating temperature of 80 degrees Celsius, the limit of HT or HTLS conductors can be up to 210 degrees Celsius, thus enabling an increase in transmission capacity while at the same time maintaining the same conductor diameter. With a high-temperature low-sag HTLS conductor, greatly and permanently increasing its capacity, nonetheless staying well within legal limits. For bottlenecks that only occur temporarily, whether dependent overhead line operation WAFB is an adequate instrument to increase the transmission capacity. Depending on the relevant environmental conditions e.g. temperature, WAFB determines the temporarily transportable electricity and uses it in real-time grid operation. For example, when the weather is colder and the conductor can therefore be cooled off more easily, more electricity can be transported than at higher temperatures. Technology Types HTLS conductors can be one of four types. Type 0. Conventional steel core reinforced aluminum conductors ACSR or ACSRTW for operating temperatures less than 100 degrees Celsius. Type 1. Conductors consisting of a strength member made of steel, coated steel, or steel alloy, and an envelope for which the high temperature effects are mitigated by means of thermal resistant aluminum alloys taser, TSSR. Type 2. Conductors consisting of a strength member made of steel, coated steel, or steel alloy, and an envelope for which the high temperature effects are mitigated by means of annealed aluminum ACSS. Type 3. Conductors consisting of a metal matrix composite MMC strength member, and an envelope for which the high temperature effects are mitigated by means of thermal resistant aluminum alloys or annealed aluminum, ACCR, ACMR. Type 4. Conductors consisting of a polymer matrix composite PMC strength member, and an envelope for which the high temperature effects are mitigated by means of annealed aluminum or thermal resistant aluminum alloys for HTLS applications ACPR. The aluminum alloy or annealed aluminum will give the conductor the characteristics to withstand high temperatures without losing mechanical properties. The special core will give the low sag characteristics due to low coefficient of thermal expansion CTE and high Young modulus. Transmission line towers are the supporting structures to hang the conductors of an overhead line. Generally, they are placed at intervals of 300 to 500 meters in the case of 380 kV lines. If the transmission line tower is only used as a support, it is called an intermediate support. At points where the line changes its angle, angle supports are used that must withstand the tractive forces of the conductors. Here, the insulators are not directed downwards but aligned with the conductors. There also exist special tower types for specific purposes junction towers to branch off a circuit and terminal supports for the transition to a substation or underground cable. Depending on the voltage level, the conductor configuration and the natural environment in which the transmission line towers are located, different types are required. The tower most frequently used in TSOs are the conventional two-level pylon so-called Danube tower, followed by the single-level pylon and the pylon with the vertical double arrangement barrel type. The Danube or two-level pylon is a tower for two three-phase current circuits. The conductors here are always arranged in a triangle. On the lower cross arm, there are two conductor bundles per circuit and one on the upper cross arm. In the case of a single-level pylon, all conductors are arranged on the same level. The single level arrangement makes for a lower construction height of the towers but also for a wider corridor. It is used when the towers are not authorized to be too high, for instance in bird migration areas. A barrel type pylon or pylon with vertical double arrangement is a design for overhead lines with three cross arms. The three conductors of a circuit are arranged, arranged vertically. The widths of the three levels create a barrel shaped profile. Barrel type pylons need a less wide corridor, but are higher than the similar Danube pylons. Compact line is the new technical development of a 380 kV overhead line. 
It was developed between 2013 and 2017 in the scope of a research and development project under 50 Hz's lead. The overhead line is characterized by solid towers with innovative suspension of the live conductors, the construction height and rot width are reduced compared to traditional overhead lines. The insulators The operational safety of a line relies heavily on the insulation of the electrical conductors. Because of their low conductivity, insulators prevent the power flow from entering the earthed towers via the conductor fittings. They are primarily used outdoors and are therefore subject to different environmental influences e.g. precipitation, temperature fluctuations, accumulation of dirt. Due to the electrical and mechanical strain on an insulator, three alternative materials have prevailed worldwide, porcelain, glass and certain types of plastic. Most TSOs mainly uses porcelain long rod insulators, which are particularly suitable for a grid voltage of 110 kV and upwards. In the case of extra high voltage lines, strings of several insulators are used. Why is an insulator often shaped like a wall plug? Weather influences can considerably degrade the dielectric strength. Owing to pollution and moisture, a conductive layer can form on the surface, thereby adversely affecting the insulator's function. This creates a so-called leakage current across the surface, which in turn causes a transmission loss and in the worst case scenario, scenario, can lead to a short circuit. In order to avoid this, the creepage distance is increased by means of the rib shape. What are electric and magnetic fields? Wherever power flows, there are electric and magnetic fields. Electric fields are the result of voltage, while magnetic fields are created by the current. The strength of the fields underneath an overhead line depends on several factors such as the voltage level and the intensity of the current the distance to the corridor and between the conductors and the ground. The configuration and the distance of the conductors to each other other electrical circuits on the tower. In the case of overhead lines, the electric and magnetic fields diminish quickly as the distance increases. They are at their strongest directly underneath the conductor bundle, where the conductors are closest to the ground at the middle of the span. This distance cannot be less than 7.8 meters at a voltage of 380 kV, also in case of high strain, for instance as a result of environmental influences. Occasionally, overhead lines are suspected of being detrimental to health because of the normally occurring electric and magnetic fields. Studies, however, have found no correlation between electric and magnetic fields and the deterioration of health. Negative impact of transmission lines. The limit values in order to exclude a negative impact on people's health, the legislation laid down exact limit values or precautionary values in the Federal Emission Protection Ordinance. In buildings and on properties where people reside longer than temporarily, the following limit values apply to new and existing installations. For alternating current lines for the electric field strength is 5 kV per m and for the magnetic flux density, 100 microtesla. For direct current lines the electric field strength has no limit value defined and for the magnetic flux density 500 μt microtesla. Noise at overhead lines. When electrical energy is transported via overhead lines, this can result in noise that is generated in certain weather conditions. Causes of noise are electrical discharges that cause ionization of the air fragmentation of air molecules, the so-called corona effect, can be distinguished as crackling and humming. These corona noises are generated directly at the conductors. Wind noises and vibrations at the conductors and steel girder sides of the towers as of approximate 15 meters per second wind speed 7. The wind noises can be compared to whistling noises inside the frame of the lattice towers. The recommended values are delivered by the technical instructions on noise abatement of the Federal Republic and differ depending on the type of area. For a pure residential area, for example, the recommended value is 50 dBA during the day and 35 dBA at night. How loud are 35 and 50 dBA decibel A is a measurement of the sound pressure level. The added A indicates that the different sound frequencies are rated differently depending on personal perception. In other words, the middle frequencies are taken greater account of. For a human with healthy ears, the hearing threshold is already 0 dBA. Transmission losses. Mostly TSO worldwide has around 6% of the electrical power provided is lost in the power grid across all voltage levels. The larger part is lost at the distribution level. To keep the transmission losses on its overhead lines as low as possible, for instance if we favor the use of lines with an extra high voltage of 380 kilovolts, after all, the higher the voltage, the lower the loss of power. When transporting energy in electrical systems, energy losses occur. This refers to the difference between the generated electrical power and
and the power plant and the consumed electrical power. They are mainly caused by the ohmic conductor resistance and in that case, occur in the form of heat losses ohmic losses. What is reactive power? Reactive power is energy that moves back and forth through the line with the frequency of the alternating current. It is needed to create the electric field required for the power to flow. Nevertheless, reactive power can, contrary to active power actual electrical output, not be used directly by the consumer. Facts about underground cable technology. How many underground cables have to be laid? For the underground cabling of a powerful 380 kV three-phase current line with two circuits polyphase alternating current, up to 12 underground cables, six cables per system are needed. A similar direct current line only requires about four underground cables. The construction site and the necessary route width for a direct current cable are therefore smaller than for a similar alternating current cable. Consequently, the impact on the soil and environment is also much smaller. What happens in case of damage? Underground cables are resistant to storms and lightning. Here, rather, the couplings between individual cable lengths joints are potential weak points. If an accident occurs on an underground cable, the damage must be located, the soil excavated and the cable section in question ought to be repaired or replaced. This can take several weeks. Damage to an overhead line can more often than not fixed within a couple of days. Which losses occur during transmission? In the case of three-phase current transmission or alternating current, reactive power must be compensated at regular intervals. This requires additional technical installations. For direct current transmission, however, no reactive power should be compensated as the physics are different. When the age of electricity had just begun, it was still unclear how the electricity should be transported as direct or as alter alternating current, also called three-phase current. Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, favored direct current in the USA. In the end, however, alternating current became the worldwide standard for electricity transmission, as this technology offered decisive advantages for example, it is relatively simple to change the voltage level using transformers, which is important for the transmission of electricity across large distances. Furthermore, it is easier to switch alternating current lines on and off. HBDC used worldwide today, HBDC lines are operated worldwide and many new ones are being built. Extensively long HBDC overhead lines are for instance being constructed in China, India or Brazil, with voltages of 1500 to 80 kV. For plastic insulated underground and submarine cables, a voltage of 320 kV has established itself. The current generation of underground cables has been designed for 525 kV. However, there are limits as well. An HBDC link requires expensive converter installations. These transform direct current into the alternating current traditionally used in the grid, and vice versa. At present, HBDC lines can only be operated as point-to-point -point connections. Today, a meshed grid, as used for alternating current, is still a technological impossibility. Regarding the technical aspect, switching direct current at the extra high voltage level is considerably more problematic than for alternating current, and not yet finely tuned. The longer the HBDC link, the more joints are required, increasing the vulnerability of the line. Parts of overhead lines run through forested areas and cross them through aisles. From an ecological point of view, these aisles can be considered lifelines. When constructing new overhead lines, TSOs makes a point of affecting flora and fauna as little as possible. New habitats emerge in the aisles, often with active support. Here, the most varied and often sensitive biotopes and habitats can develop for insects, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Even rare plants, such as many of the native orchids, can be found in these newly created and emerged habitats.